Good afternoon. I hope everything is going well for you and you're having a good day. Yes. So I'm going to do Sutta number 115. The Bahu the Datu Datuka, excuse me, the many kinds of elements. This is a sutta that I've done before, but it's been a long time since I've done it. So, Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetsis Grove, Anathant and Dika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Monks, whatever fears arise, all arise because of the fool not because of the wise man. Whatever troubles arise, all arise because of the fool, not the wise man. Whatever calamities arise, all arise because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Just as a fire that starts in a shed made of rushes or grass, burns down even a house with a peaked roof with walls plastered inside and outside shut, up, shut off, secured by bars with shutter windows, so too. Whatever fear arises, all arises because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Thus the fool brings fear, the wise man brings no fear. The fool brings trouble, the wise man brings no trouble. The fool brings calamity, the wise man brings no calamity. No fear comes from the wise man. No trouble comes from the wise man. No calamity comes from the wise man. Therefore, you should train thus. We shall be wise men. We shall be inquirers. There's a lot of people that are having fear arise in their meditation. And when you inquire into what it really is, look at the clock. David, 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 yeah. look at the clock. Okay. And there are times when you're sitting in meditation, fear can arise. So, first thing we want to look at is what is fear? How does it arise? Fear is the painful feeling to start off with. Next, you take that fear or that, that painful feeling and you make it yours personally. This is me, this is mine, this is myself. Then you get involved in your thoughts and opinions and ideas about this kind of feeling that you're taking personally and you feel 
tightness in your back. You feel tightness in your buttocks. You feel like running away. Then you get into the habitual emotional tendency. Now, because it starts as a fear, it starts as a feeling. Now, you have five aggregates that you're made of. You have body, feeling, perception. These two always are conjoined. You have thoughts and you have consciousness. When that fear comes up, you start thinking about it and you try to make the fear go away by your thoughts. But feeling is one thing and thoughts are something else. You can never control a feeling with your thoughts. So, what am I actually saying here? Fear is only a feeling. The fastest way to make this feeling go away is by stopping getting involved and in making a big deal about that feeling. Stop taking it personally. What's the fastest way to do that? Laugh. Sounds odd. But you go from I am that fear, I am afraid, I don't like that fear, I want it to stop and go away. All of those thoughts make the fear bigger and more intense. But I don't like that feeling, I want it to stop. When you laugh, you go from I am afraid to it's only a feeling. It's only fear. It's not even my fear. Did I ask this fear to come up? Did I sit and say, you know, I haven't been afraid of stuff for a long time. I might as well be afraid of it now. No, you don't do that. It comes up, you start identifying with it, you start trying to change that feeling with your thoughts, and the more you think a feeling, the bigger and more intense that feeling becomes. So we have to start changing our perspective of that feeling. We have to start allowing that feeling to be there, but don't make a big deal out of it. It's not yours, so why do you want to control it? Oh, it's only my habitual tendency. My habitual reaction to a feeling that comes and your habitual reaction is taking it personally. This is me, this is mine. I don't like this. I want it to stop. I'm really afraid. Now, every time you have this kind of sensation arise, you are really causing yourself much more pain and suffering. Okay? And you're doing it to yourself. Why is this such a big deal? It is such a big deal because you make it a big deal. Well, but all, all the muscles in my back are tight or my buttocks. 
and I, and I'm really afraid, and the hair on my on my arms or back of my neck stand up. Okay, so did you ask for any of that to occur? Did you say, now I need to have all of my muscles tightened? Or do you feel those muscles tighten and that makes you think even more? And take it personally and fight with it. The more you think and ponder on that is the inclination of your mind. You think and ponder on fear, and you're going to have it come up much more often. Well, what's the cause of the fear? We don't care. What you do with what arises in the present dictates what happens in the future. If you react or act like you always do when fear arises, you can look forward to having that fear come up often. Because that's what you think and ponder on. And that's what you try to control with your thoughts. And that causes all kinds of suffering in other ways. And you become frustrated, you become angry, you have all kinds of emotional trigger points that arise just because a fear arose and I don't like that fear. Just because a feeling arose and I don't like that fear. Anything you make a big deal out of, anything that you identify closely with as being yours, that's the cause of suffering. Okay? So we have the first two noble truths right there, right? So how do you get to the third noble truth? Laugh. You can use the six R's, but you have to understand the six R's are not a stick to beat away that feeling. You can't use it to suppress that feeling or force that feeling to go away. The six R's are simply so that your mindfulness gets better and you can see how you're causing pain. And how you're causing pain is by not following the six R's completely. Well, this painful feeling came up and I'm afraid. Okay, what, what is really happening? Why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we cause this pain to be such a big deal? Well, it's old habit. It's a feeling that you don't like. There's no difference between fear and depression. It's still a feeling. It's a little different kind of a feeling. And I don't like that. And I get caught in my opinions and ideas about what it is and how I don't like it and how I can make it stop, but that's getting caught in your thinking. And then you want to control the feeling with the thought. Do you see how much pain and suffering you cause yourself? And the solution is simple. 
It's a feeling. Okay. What's the second R of the six R's? Release. How do you release? You don't keep your attention on that feeling. If you keep your attention on the feeling, you're feeding that feeling so it gets bigger and more intense. But I hate that feeling. I don't want that feeling. I want to run away. Okay, you can do that. And you can suffer a lot more. It's up to you. Remember, I'm not your teacher. I am a guide. And I'm showing you th your way through a very naughty situation that is can be big if you make it big. Can be painful if you make it painful to yourself. When you stop keeping your attention on it. Okay, it's a painful feeling. So, I had a root canal without any painkiller. You think that didn't hurt? You think that feeling was pleasurable, like you want all, all feelings to be when they come up? Well, welcome to real life. The first noble truth is there's going to be suffering. The second noble truth is the one, and it's your choice. The cause of the suffering is taking it personally and feeding it, and causing your mind to get really involved with making it stop, making it go away. And to be quite honest, if you look at it objectively, it's just your mind going crazy. And that's funny. Your mind wants to distract you. You're getting too close to some kind of a thing that your mind doesn't really want to look at. So, your choice. Get involved with it, feed it, make it bigger, and suffer a long and hard time. Or let it be. Don't keep your attention on it. It's only a painful feeling. And it's not even yours. Don't you see that that's funny? that you're taking it personally, that you're causing yourself all of this suffering. You're causing it to yourself. You can't blame somebody else for your painful feeling. And isn't that funny? I had one lady come up to me and she told me that she was really afraid and I said, well, okay, use the six R's. They don't work. Oh, okay. Then smile into it. Laugh with it. She said, it's not funny. And as soon as she said that, it was such an absurd statement that I started laughing. And when I started laughing, she started laughing. And then I said, how's your mind feel now? Oh, I feel a lot better. I'm not afraid anymore. Hmm. Now, this is in, in the span of maybe one minute. This is why I like 
when the Buddha is talking about the good qualities of the Dhamma, the second quality is Akaliko. And that says that the Dhamma is immediately effective. And it is when you use the Dhamma in the correct way. Now there's, there's starting to be translators that are saying that it means that the, the Dhamma is always around. No, that's not what Akaliko means. So they're changing the translation to suit their purpose, but it's not the actual translation of the word. Akaliko is quickly, immediately, effective. It works, and it works fast. Now, Everybody here probably knows that I've done an awful lot of Vipassana meditation. I did it for about 20 years. I've done many years of deep practice. And that is not what I call immediately effective. I give retreats now for 10 days. When people come for a retreat, whether they've ever done meditation before or they're very advanced in their meditation, in 10 days they will understand the Dhamma more deeply than they ever have before because of the six R's. Not feeding the um, hindrance, whatever hindrance it happens to be. Not taking it personally. Seeing that everything is fine. When you use the six R's and trust it. You have to trust the six R's. You can't use the six R's as a stick to beat stuff away and make it stop coming up. That's not what it's for. The six R's are how to let go of the cause of suffering. That means letting go of craving. Relax. Relax that tightness in your head, in your mind. When you relax your tightness in your head, in your mind, that also starts to relax the entire body. Now you'll get to certain places in your meditation where you don't even feel your body anymore. And this is good. You, do, you won't feel it unless a feeling arises and you start taking it personally and you say, oh, I've got a pain in my back or my knee or wherever it happens to be. And when you come to me and I start talking to you about if you're at this level of meditation, you don't have a body. Everything is mental. Remember the Dhammapada. Mind is a forerunner of all states. Mind made they are. So this pain in your knee or your back or your, your bottom, when it comes up and you're in the higher realms of meditation where you're in the different states, not where you're uh, not, not where you're still in the lower jhanas, the first four jhanas. 
you're in the higher states. You don't have a body. The only way you feel the body is when there is contact with something else. A fly lands on your, on your face. You will feel that because the contact is there. But it doesn't make your mind shake. It doesn't make your mind run to it and make it want to go away quick. Now, let's look at what happens when a fly lands on your face. What happens first? Oh, there's a feeling. I don't like that feeling. I wish this fly would go away. I wish it would stop. Every thought about the fly encourages the fly to stay longer and cause more suffering. What's the difference between a fly and a feeling of fear or anxiety? What's the difference? When you look at it objectively, there isn't any real difference. A feeling is a feeling is a feeling. Sometimes they're pleasant feelings, sometimes they're painful feelings. You're not in control of it. You don't ask these feelings to come up. You need to allow the space for them to be there by themselves. But I don't like that feeling. I don't care. It's not yours, so what, what's there to like or dislike? But I feel it. And it makes me so afraid I want to cry sometimes. Who is causing that suffering? Who is making themselves unhappy? Well, I can blame the movies. I went to a horror movie and it scared me so much I couldn't hardly sit. Well, what's the difference between that and the fear that comes up when you're by yourself someplace? And fear comes up. There's no difference. It's a feeling. And it's not a pleasant feeling. And it's okay for it to be there. One of the things that I found is being more and more, I'm teaching it more and more, is that when you have any hindrance arise, I don't care what it is, any distraction away from your object of meditation, Practice your gratitude for it being there. When these kind of hindrances arise, they come up because in the past you broke a precept and you felt guilty and you took it personally this is me this is mine this is who i am that's the whole reason for hindrances arising now when it arises it's your teacher it's telling you where you have an attachment be thankful be grateful your mind is trying to help you see how you cause yourself pain. And when you use the six R's properly by not making a big deal out of whatever that feeling is, then it will go away by itself when you use the six R's. Now it might not go away right away. 
But every time you use the six R's and you have that relaxed step in it, and you smile and you come back to your object of meditation and your mind gets pulled away back to that feeling, that hindrance. That is not the same hindrance than it was when that you got drawn away at first. It's a different hindrance. Why do I say that? Because when you let go of that identification, when you let that craving fade away, your mind is pure. But that hindrance has some attachments into it that might have been around for a long time and been bothering you for a long time. So it comes up again. You have to keep using the six R's not as a control mechanism, just as a way to let go of that craving and desire for things to happen the way you want them to happen. So you keep using the six R's every time your mind get, is distracted, if it doesn't go away right away, You'll be back on your object of meditation and it comes up again. Okay, so what? Oh, but I don't want it to be there. I already six hearted. Well, okay, so what? Do it again. There was a movie by Woody Allen and it was called play it again sam and that's what we have to do with the six arts it's not exactly the same hindrance that you let go of when you six art it the first time but the attachment is still there with it so you have to do it again don't make a big deal out of it don't get over involved with it. Just do it again. Well, there are some attachments that can be really big. And they can last for quite a while. Okay. So, keep allowing it to be there, but don't get involved in the content of that feeling. Relax, let it be. Now this sutta is a great sutta, but I got carried away talking about fear so much that it's gonna, I'm not gonna be able to go all the way through the sutta because I get scolded if I last for more than an hour. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but we'll, we'll try again. When this was said, the Venerable asked, the Venerable Ananda asked the Blessed One, in what way, Venerable Sir, can a monk be called a wise man and an inquirer? When Ananda, a monk, is skilled in the elements, skilled in the bases, skilled in dependent origination, skilled in what is possible and what is impossible, in that way he can be called a wise man and an inquirer. Now you see why I like this sutta, because it gives you a lot of answers. Now we're going to talk about the elements. But Venerable Sir, in what way can a monk be called skilled in the elements? Here, Ananda, these 18 elements, the I element, the form 
element, the eye consciousness element, the ear element, the sound element, the ear consciousness element, the nose element, the odor element, the nose consciousness element, the tongue element, the flavor element, the tongue consciousness element, the body element, the tangible element, the body consciousness element, mind element, the mind object element, the mind consciousness element. When he knows and sees these 18 elements, a monk can be called skilled in the elements. See how simple this is. And knowing how the process works. And it's not a personal process. This is just the way this process here works. But venerable sir, might there be another way in which a, man, a monk can be called skilled in the elements? Yes, there is Ananda. There are Ananda, the six elements, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. When he knows and sees these six elements, a monk can be called skilled in the elements. Now you, you might have heard on some of the other discourses that I've given about the water element. This is a good example of how you let things be without getting involved with them. How you let the fear be by itself. When water is going downstream, it's going to come across some rocks. Is that water going to push that rock out of the way? What does it do? It just simply goes around it without making a big deal about it. That's what you do with fear. That's what you do with anxiety. That's what you do with sadness. Allow it to be there. Lightly sit are and come back to your object of meditation. Laugh with whatever distraction is there. Now, I don't mean, mean necessarily laughing out loud and having a belly laugh. I mean having a light mind about it, not taking it personally. Allowing that to be there, just let it be there by itself and go around it. Stop feeding it. So make your mind like water. The second R is release whatever it is that distracted you and let that, let your mind just kind of go around it, not make a big deal out of it not try to push that rock out of the way. That's what people do when they don't understand how mind actually works. That's why so many people become depressed because it's a painful feeling that arises and they don't like it. And then they start getting involved in their opinions and ideas about it. And then they get caught in their habitual tendency of trying to control a feeling with thoughts. And this is all done personally. This is me. This is who I am. I am in control. 
actually you're, there's nothing to control, so how can you say you're in control? There's just a bunch of phenomena arising and passing away. I just read some of that phenomena to you. You don't take it personally. You see it as an impersonal process. Now, some years ago, when I was a young monk, I didn't have a teacher that spoke English. So I got this idea that, well, what I'm going to try to do now is just try to look at every thought and feeling that comes into my mind and see where it came from. Is it mine? Did I ask these thoughts and feelings to come up? And I did it all day with all of the activities that I was doing. And I did it for about six months. And there was great benefit in taking a look at your thoughts and feelings and see, was that my thought? Where'd that come from? I was just kind of minding my own business, walking down the street, and these thoughts came up. Whose thoughts are these? I didn't plan for that thought to come up. I didn't plan for that feeling to come up. So I must not be the one that's in charge of them. So why make it a big deal? Just because it arises doesn't mean you have to take part in that. You have to allow the space for it to be by itself. Relax into it. Now, every time you relax, there's no clinging that arises. There's no opinions. There's no any ideas. And if there's no opinions and there's no ideas, then your habitual tendency won't arise. If your habitual tendency doesn't arise, that's all of your emotional garbage. If that doesn't arise, then the birth of action doesn't arise. And if the birth of action doesn't arise, Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair will not arise. What does that say? That says that your mind is clear at that time. Your mindfulness is strong at that time. So, when you use the six R's, you are purifying yourself of the links of dependent origination. You're going to see that more and more clearly as you go deeper into your meditation. Now, a lot of students here, they are doing the six directions with whatever their object of meditation is. Starts with loving kindness, goes to compassion, goes to joy, goes to equanimity. Each step is like a different kind of jhana. Each step teaches you major insights and lessons about how this process actually occurs. So now you're starting to get more and more of a feeling that when feeling arises, 
it's impersonal, it's not yours. I don't care whether it's a painful feeling or a pleasant feeling. I don't care if it's a neutral feeling. Doesn't matter what you do with what arises in the present. That dictates what happens in the future. When you use the six R's properly, you don't feed that feeling. You don't make a big deal out of that feeling. You don't try to control that feeling, but you allow it to be there by itself without keeping your attention on it. Then you are starting to purify your mind. And when you purify your mind enough, you start to have more and more fun in your life. Your mind is more uplifted. Your mind is happier. Your mind has great balance in it. And it's all because you make the decisions for what you keep your attention on. So I don't know, what time did we start? Oh, 1.15. 1.15. Oh, I still got another few minutes I can go. Okay. Bhante, can you please uh, complete this? No, I, I have done some. So the... Yeah, well, we'll see. Maybe I have time to get more done. I'm not going to... I'm probably not going to get all the way through it. But I can continue it next week. Anyway... Make your mind like water. Water always finds a way around an obstruction without complaining about it, without making it into a big deal. Stop identifying with painful feelings and thoughts. Have fun. Jeez, I, I, I wonder how many times I have to say that before people actually hear it and start practicing it. Life is supposed to be a game. Make it a fun game. Change your perspective from I'm serious and whatever is happening in the world, I have to worry about it because nobody else is going to take care of it. What, you want to affect the world around you in a positive way? Have fun. Smile. Be grateful to other people that cause you problems because they're, they're your teacher. How can you get angry at that? Okay, so, but Venerable Sir, might there be another way in which a monk can be called skilled in the elements? Yes, there is Ananda. There are Ananda, the six elements, the pleasure element, the pain element, the joy element. The grief element, the equanimity element, and the ignorance element. When he knows and sees these six elements, a monk can be called skilled in the elements. Isn't that amazing? Okay, at first he was talking about physical elements. And now he's talking about mental elements. 
the joy, the grief, the equanimity, the ignorance. These are all mental elements. And what is he, what is he describing here for real? What, what actually is he describing? He's just breaking down how craving actually works. The pleasure element, the pain element. I like it. I don't like it. Oh, isn't that saying something about craving? The joy element, that's the pleasure, that's the mental. The grief element. Well, there's no difference between the pleasant element and the joy element, and the painful element, and the grief element, except one is mental, one is physical. It's pretty easy to understand. And then you get into the equanimity element. Now that's where there's the balance. And the ignorance element. What is the ignorance element? That's not understanding in depth how the four noble truths are in everything. The four noble truths are not just this thing to be thinking about and yeah, 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 I know about that. This, this is really deep. Every link of dependent origination has the Four Noble Truths in it. And I can show you that in a lot of other suttas where it says that. But it's so popular that people just say it and they go, yeah, 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 okay, I know the Four Noble Truths. Let's go on to something better more entertaining. But when you see that it's in every different aspect of your mind and body, and when you see and deeply understand that, that leads to the cessation of suffering. So, but venerable sir, might there be another way in which a monk can be called skilled in the elements? Yes, there is Ananda. There are Ananda, these six elements. The sensual desire element. The renunciation element. The ill will element the non-ill will element, the cruelty element, and the non-cruelty element. When he knows and sees these six elements, a monk can be called skilled in the elements. This is just more the same thing. Just different ways of looking at it. One of the things that I really like about the Buddha and the way that he teaches is he'll, he'll give you the same lesson with different words, but he's always talking about four noble truths. He's always talking about the four noble truths. But how many people really don't understand that that's what he's saying? But, venerable sir, might there be another way in which a monk can be called skilled in the element? Yes, Ananda, there are. There are these three elements. The sense sphere element. Now, this is what I call habitual tendency element. 
This is talking about uh, bhava, the Pali word bhava. I talked with my teacher, Usila Nanda, about this, and I told him that for practical purposes, I want to call it habitual tendency or a habitual emotional tendency. It can be either one. And not add these other two parts to it. And he agreed. And then I started listening to other monks talk about these uh, bhava and these, these three different uh, aspects of it. And I started replacing it with the words habitual tendency, and it made perfect sense. So that's why I use that. It's not complete. The other part of bhava is the different kinds of jhana and states that you can experience. The element of the fine material. Okay. What is a fine material? That, that's the heavenly realms. That's the Brahma realms. That's when you practice meditation and you can experience even the first jhana when you die that is such strong merit that you're going to be reborn in a heavenly realm or a brahma realm Okay, and you have the potential to attain Nibbana in this lifetime. I just had a student today that attained Nibbana. She went from a very serious mind to a happy mind that truly understands the different aspects of the teaching made me very happy it can happen for you if you follow the directions one of the fetters that you get rid of when you attain nibbana is doubt. You no longer have any doubt what the real path is. You know for yourself that this is it. And I'm going to keep going with this until I get off the wheel. And that's one of the fetters that completely disappears. This is why I like this kind of meditation, because it teaches you in the right way. And you can experience this if you follow the directions precisely. Don't add anything, don't subtract anything. Okay, so there is the fine material element, which is the first four jhanas, and the immaterial element, which is the next four states, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing, neither perception nor non-perception. When he knows and sees the three elements, a monk can be called skilled in the elements. Are you? But venerable sir, might there be another way in which a monk can be called skilled in the elements? Yes, Ananda, there are. 
Ananda, there are these two elements, the conditioned element and the unconditioned element. When he knows and sees these two elements, a monk can be called skilled in the elements. Conditioned elements, everything in the physical world, everything. Unconditioned. The only way you get to an unconditioned is by experiencing Nibbana. That is the unconditioned state. And as I just got through saying, you can experience this in this lifetime. A lot of people that come and practice with me are able to verify what I'm saying. I'm not saying it as some kind of thing that I'm some kind of great teacher. I'm not. The teacher is the Buddha. And I read these suttas every night when you come for retreat. and your progress is going to be fast. Of course, I see you every day for a short period of time and, and ask you questions about your meditation. Make sure you're staying on the right path. And I'm going to be staying here all year round, except for when we go to California around the Easter time. But venerable sir, in what way can a monk be called skilled in the basis? There are Ananda the six internal and external bases, the eye and forms, the ear and sound the nose and odors, the tongue and flavors, the body and tangibles, mind and mind objects. When he knows and sees these six internal and external bases, a monk can be called skilled in the bases. That's just seeing the internal and external forms of your sense bases. All of your sense bases are in your head. But venerable sir, in what way can a monk be called skilled in dependent origination? Here Ananda, a monk knows thus, when this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When he does, when this does not exist, that does not come to be. Now I just gave you an example of that. When you use the six R's correctly, you don't have clinging, you don't have habitual tendency, you don't have birth of action, you don't have sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. You don't have that aging and death. It won't arise. With the cessation of this, that ceases. See, it's the same thing. That is, with ignorance as condition, formations come to be. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. 
with contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual tendency comes to be. With habitual tendency as condition, birth of action comes to be. With birth of action as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Sounds familiar? You want to hear that more often? Go to Sutta number 38 in YouTube. There's many of them. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes cessation of formations. With the cessation of formation, cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of mentality, materiality comes to be. With the cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of the sixfold base. With the cessation of the sixfold base, cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact, cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of habitual tendency. With the cessation of habitual tendency, cessation of birth of action. With the cessation of the birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. In this way, Ananda, a monk, can be called skilled, independent origination. Now, I, I, when I was in Burma, I went to a monastery, and the only kind of mental de development they had was reciting the links of dependent origination over and over and over and over. And they would do it sometimes for two or three hours. And they did it every day. And you say, well, they're not really meditating. They are. It's just a different kind of meditation. Can they become sotapanna by doing that? Yes, they can. Can they become Sakadagami, the second stage of awakening, by reciting this over and over again and understanding how it works? Yes, they can. Can they become Anagami, the third stage of awakening, by doing this? No, they have to have deeper concentration, they have to have deeper kinds of understanding and insights. A lot of people say that Vipassana just means insight. Well, the Vipassana and the serenity practice, they go hand in hand. They're yoked together. Too many times people unyoke them and they spend a lot of time on insights, but not so much time on having a collective mind. Now, if you have, have a ox cart and those oxen aren't yoked together, you're not going to go anywhere. One is going to go one place and one is going to go another, but they're not going to be going together at the same time. So you have to yoke them together. Now, if one 
of the oxen is particularly strong and the other oxen is weak, the strong one is going to dictate and you're going to go around in circles. Okay, if the other one is dictating, then you're going to go around circles the other way. They have to be pulled equally together. That means jhana practice and insight practice at the same time. That's the only way it works. That's what it says in the suttas. So the strong attachment to insight without developing a collected mind with understanding of how each of the jhanas work. And jhanas are a step or a level of understanding. Okay, there's a, the level of understanding. It's not, oh, this is strong concentration. I better do my vipassana first. No, you do them together. And that's what the Buddha taught in many, many suttas. The reason that so many people are doing straight vipassana and think that it's the only way is because of the book that was written a thousand years after the Buddha died called the Visuddhimagga. It was written by a monk called Buddhaghosa. And at the time, well, let's put it this way. Right after the Buddha died, all of a sudden, there were 17 different Buddhist sects. And they were all watching over different parts of the suttas and the vinaya, the disciplinary rules. So, a thousand years after the time of the Buddha, well, these, these different sects have kind of gone on their own way. And they emphasize different parts of Buddhist practice, but they didn't really have an organized thing. And Buddha Gosa went to Sri Lanka and his task was to take four of these different sects and their commentary, which was written in Sri Lankan, and turn it into a Pali text. Now, he was a Vedic scholar. He had memorized all of the Vedas before he became a Buddhist monk. So he still had some ideas that were very Brahmin and you could call it Hindu. So he didn't know much in the way of meditation. He was a scholar. And when it got to the part where he started talking about meditation, well, he didn't know much about it, but he knew that meditation was around and meditation is meditation, right? They're all the same thing. So he put his understanding of what it said in the Vedas, he put that into the Visuddhimagga as if it came from the Buddha. And it actually didn't. And he left out some very important things, like uh, what, what he wound up doing was, let's say, uh, with uh, 
equanimity, karuna, uh, or, or karuna, which is compassion. He would take one of those words and he would divide it up into eight or ten different ways that it can be used. And that caused a lot of confusion. There's uh, no, another word was a sadha, faith. Well, there's, there's nine different kinds of faith. What he did was he broke all of these different parts of the Buddha teaching into separate little baskets. There's nine of this. There's eight of that. There's ten of, you say, upeka. Ten kinds of opeka. Well, that's good for intellectual knowledge, but it's not good for practice. But over the years, that's been taken as the practice. People consider the Visuddhi Magga the encyclopedia of meditation. And it's taken from the Vedas, the type of meditation that he taught. And he was also taking a lot of information from different commentaries. A commentary is one person's opinion of what he thinks the Buddha was talking about. Okay, that's that monk's opinion. It's not necessarily the Buddha's opinion. And that's what a lot of the Visuddhi Magga is about. It's about one monk's impression about what he thought the Buddha was talking about. And it's not as correct as it could be. It's the reason that there's so much division between people that practice straight vipassana and people that practice samatha vipassana. Now I call it twin, tranquil, wisdom, insight, meditation. That's what twin stands for. And that's what you're actually practicing when you practice with me. That means you practice the six arts. You practice right effort. Every time you use the six arts, you are following the entire eightfold path at that time. Right then, right there. Immediately effective. So it's important that you understand that if you start dividing this and that and taking one part of this and then adding it to one part of that, it's going to become confused and it's not going to work as well. I can tell you that for sure because I had 20 years of doing that and it didn't work. But as soon as I figured out that relaxed step, as soon as I finally understood that, my entire meditation changed. My understanding changed. My ability to read a sutta and see what the Buddha is talking about changed. Because I didn't have this Visuddhi Magga in the background that was always pushing me towards it. Now I just use the suttas. And in this way, I can help you to be successful with your meditation. Because I'm following what the Buddha said. I'm not making up stuff. And you hear me right now, you're hearing me read all of the different stuff that's in a sutta. Not my ideas. It's coming from the Buddha. 
Now we, we're about 2,500 years after the Buddha. It's actually more like 2,600 years after the Buddha. Parinibbana. And the Dhamma is in reasonably good shape. It doesn't mean it's 100% correct with every sutta. It's not. There's still some interpretations that are put in that are not necessarily good adaptations of what the Buddha was, was trying to teach. But there's enough in the suttas themselves that you can still be successful. And you can see that for yourself. Don't believe anything I'm saying. Don't believe a word of it. Check it out. See for yourself. See whether you're smiling all day, whether that improves your mindfulness or not. See for yourself. When you turn life into a game instead of being serious with it, see what it does to your perception. See how it changes. So, now we go to the possible and the impossible. But venerable sir, in what way can a monk be called skilled in what is possible and what is impossible? Here, Ananda, a monk understands it is impossible it cannot happen that a, pers a person possessing right view could treat any formation as permanent. There's no such a possibility. And he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might treat some formation as permanent. I, I can remember when I was in college, I, I used to go by this church and they had a sign outside and it said, Jesus Christ, the same now and always. That saying that this Jesus Christ is permanent. God is permanent and it's not actually the way things work. The only thing that's permanent in the entire universe is impermanence. That's the only thing that, that, is, that is impermanent. And that means that everything is in a state of change. I mean, when, when I'm giving you a retreat and I tell you that sound of my snapping my finger is about a hundred thousand arising and passing away of hearing consciousness. And you will be able to get to that state and see that for itself. And you're going to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. Now you think you're hearing me and seeing me at the same time, but it's not happening that way. Hearing consciousness keeps arising and passing away. And then every now and then a seeing consciousness arises and passes away. And then it, it, they, they're happening so fast that you think it's happening at exactly the same time. So, he understands it is impossible, it cannot happen that a, a person possessing right view can treat any formation as pleasurable. There is no possibility.
and he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might treat some formation as pleasurable. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person possessing right view could treat anything as self. Hmm. But we do that all the time. We get caught in, what was I talking about before? We get caught in hindrances. Why do we get caught in hindrances? Because we broke precepts in the past and we have guilty feeling and we took it personally. I did this. This is me. You don't see the impersonal nature until you use the six R's correctly. And he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might treat something as self. Well, that happens almost all the time. Everybody is taking their thoughts and their feelings and sensations personally. This is mine. This is who I am. And we cause ourselves immeasurable, immeasurable amounts of suffering because of that. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person person possessing right view, right view, that's the first noble, or the first part of the eight, eightfold path. And what does that mean? I call it harmonious, um, Perspective. 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 Thank you. It was coming. Harmonious perspective. But what does that mean? A harmonious perspective is one that sees everything as being part of a process. It doesn't have any me, my, or I in it. Everything on the physical plane is part of right view when you see it as being impersonal. Ah. And actually, this goes on for quite a bit. And I think this is a good place to stop. So if you want to go take a look at this, this is Sutta one, number 115, we're at section number 12, the possible and the impossible. So, do you have any questions? If I keep going with the sutta, it's going to take another hour to an hour and a half to finish it. This is a long sutta. There's a lot to it. So that's why I want to stop now because I've been talking for an hour and a half as it is. Bante, I have uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, 
you first always, one. You always have good questions. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bante. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, this sutta. I enjoyed uh -huh. it. Um, the first question was related to dependent origination. Yeah. And I like in in some other places I listened that dependent origination is divided into three lives. Yes, that's that's Buddha Gosa and the Surimaga. Yeah. So, but sometimes and like uh, in your some of your talks, you say that every time the consciousness arises and passes away, this is rebirth. Right. Uh, then do we have to see the dependent origination? Like whenever there is rebirth is happening, the whole Chinese... The whole process is happening. Yes, that's right. And it happens very fast. And the understanding of three lifetimes is not the same as the ordinary thinking. It's the lifetime of the consciousness. And it arises and passes away. And another one arises and passes away. And you're seeing that as three different lifetimes. Yeah. Okay. So it's not this big gross idea of I have to live however many years for one lifetime. This is, that's why the misunderstanding um, in the Visuddhi Magga causes a lot of suffering because so many people take it to mean three actual lifetimes, but they're not seeing it as a lifetime of the consciousness that arises and passes away. And uh, like sub question for this one, like uh, the link in this link, there is one one link of birth. Birth is always birth of action, right? Right. Okay. Uh, I can jump into my next question. Okay. Okay. The next question is um, like, can I say something like this? Uh, Without knowing the links of, without knowing the four noble truths, it is impossible that a person can get liberated. Uh, this is saying I am because that's that's a, that's, that's a difficult thing because. Uh, there are some people that all they have to do is hear it one time and they understand it and they can attain Nirvana from that. They don't have to memorize it and they don't have to go over it and over it and over it. But it depends on the insights that a person has on their own. It depends on what happened in past lifetimes, they might have done massive amounts of meditation and had very deep understanding, but didn't quite put it all together. And then they can hear a Dhamma talk, especially when it's done by a Buddha, and they can attain Nibbana from that without, quote, knowing the Four Noble Truths but they understand how the process works. So they don't divide it into four different things. They just see it as, as it's occurring and understand deeply that yeah, this is suffering, there's a cause, there is a cessation in the way to it. They might have to just, now this is during the time of the Buddha, not so much now, uh, all I have to do is hear what the Buddha is saying and understand it deeply. And they can attain Nibbana that way. 
a sub question to this one mm. so once uh, once a person attains nibbana then after that can he appreciate the four noble truths oh yeah absolutely he'll have a deep understanding of it you can attain nibbana without a deep understanding of it okay uh, uh those two were my questions mante thank you for answering okay yeah. anybody else have a... mante yes uh may i add to the answer that you gave for that uh, understanding of the fourth noble truth i didn't um, I'm, i'm not understanding your question the four noble uh, are you are you able to hear me i am still not understanding are you able to hear me try putting it up a little bit okay try one more time okay. are you able to hear me now i'm not able to i am able to hear you now but i'm not able to grasp what you're asking i just wanted to tell you that uh, during this process of meditation uh the the first thing that happens that when we come for a meditation we see we are understanding something about the uh, the first noble truth that's the reason that we inquire into this samma right uh-huh. and uh, as we go on to the jhana we start understanding what was craving and how it had affected us all our life uh uh-huh. the second noble truth yeah uh-huh. the third noble truth was like uh, we understand succession or the nibbana Uh, cessation the nirodha and nibbana and uh, while we are reflecting that whatever we have been doing all this time was the actually we were practicing the noble eight fold path so uh, after the experience of nibbana we start understanding uh, the whole of the four noble truths in its uh, details like uh, how this this suffering is working over here how it is a noble truth of suffering and so what the question that time you know Uh, i just i just wanted to add to what you were telling like uh, is it right the way i am telling you yes as long as you're using the six rs you're practicing it correctly six rs are the last noble truth the way to the cessation of suffering if you're practicing with the six rs you are practicing it correctly whatever your object of meditation happens to be okay yeah thank you okay quite often people they they tell me this is too simple it's got to be more complicated than this but that's one of the beauties of the buddhist teaching is he made it simple on purpose there are stories about the brahmins coming that were highly educated and they started asking him a question that might go for 15 or 20 minutes just a question and it's full of all kinds of very deep ideas and then the buddha would and they say do you think this is correct and then the buddha would say i'm going to give you the dhamma and he would do it in such a simple way that they would walk away just shaking their head they couldn't believe it can be that simple now i say it's simple it's not always easy when you have fear it's not sometimes easy to let it go and laugh with it but as you do it over and over again you are letting go of the suffering okay so now i'm going to share some merit may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. 
May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. You all have a good, fun week. Smile and be happy. Thank you. Thank you. Bhante. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante.